Thank you for choosing to listen to today's message by Reverend Dr. David Entry. We know you will be blessed as you seek and serve God. We believe that this message will stir up a desire for more of God, even as you listen. Be blessed. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Verse 7 to 8, sorry. Verse 7, that was through 8. I'm not through somewhere, yeah. Revelation chapter 7, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut. And no one can shut it. If you have a little, a, 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 no one can shut. Sorry, no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will say. Sorry, I will make those of the synagogues of. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are. Jews and are not, but I lie, uh, but I lie, uh, but, but lie indeed, I will make them come and worship before your, your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to, pre- to persevere. I will also keep you from the, the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one takes your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Last week I explained how the church of Philadelphia, um, the city uh, planted in the city of Philadelphia, um, the city of Philadelphia, I explained how we got the name Philadelphia, the king, Apelles, who loved his brother, um, Eumenes, so much that he was nicknamed Philadelphus. And he actually was the founder of the, the, um, the city of Philadelphia. So they named the city after him. But the city had undergone a few name changes. In the first place, it was changed from Philadelphia to New Caesarea after the Caesar Tiberia, Tiberia who helped them rebuild the city in around 70 AD when the earthquake occurred. And afterwards, it was changed again to Flavia. We, after the, um, the, the emperor, em, emperor, and it was changed again to Flavia, yeah, after the emperor, emperor Caesar. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm just making sure that, <laughs> praise the Lord. All right. So it was changed again. And then after, afterwards, they changed it back to Philadelphia. So it's a city that has the emperor Vespasian, yeah, Flavia, that's his family name. And then afterwards, it was changed back to Philadelphia. So it's a city that has become, it was familiar with changes of names. And it was familiar with building, as I told you, because of earthquake and the aftershocks. Um, sometimes affected the buildings there, so they had to be doing rebuilding. And I told you about how the city was a prosperous city because it was a city of uh, good agriculture, particularly vine. Okay, the vine tree flourished there, so they had, wine was in abundance, and they had the god of wine, Dionysius. So it's, it's a very interesting city. And all these things are necessary to know because it bears a connection to the message Jesus gave to the city. All right. So now Jesus said, comes to the city, said to the angel of the, the church of Philadelphia, right? These things say he who is holy. I told you that he, when Jesus came to, wanted to talk to the church of Philadelphia, he concentrated on two things. 
who he was and what he does. So who was he? he or who is he? He says that he is holy and he is true. He who has the key of David. Let's all say the key of David. The key of David. Say, let, let's say it again, please. The key of David. The key of David. He who has the key of David. He who opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. It's a very interesting um, present submission. And last week I explained that this particular phrase was directly from the Isaiah chapter 22, from verse 15, about this Shepna. Shepna, the <laughs> key holder, <laughs> the keeper, who was using his position to align his, uh, to line his pocket and to his selfish agenda. And God said, I'll clear him and replace him with Eliakim. And I'll give the, the, uh, the government of the house to Eliakim and I'll give him the keys of David. Now, this is very important. I've actually been doing a, a bit of checks and checking what other theologians and other, <coughs> um, other commentators, Bible, Bible commentators, have got to say about the key of David. And much of what they say is very much related to Isaiah chapter 22, which is very true, and Shibna. But it draws me back to when I was teaching on David. You know, I spoke about David the builder. David the builder. And I think having had that understanding in this church, I can't just stay on Isaiah and not touch on the key of David because I, when I, that message about David, I spoke about what did David do to make him the father of the Messiah? Because you could not be a Messiah unless you are a, a seed of David. What, what the, you must be a seed of Abraham because you are Jew. But not, not all Jews are from, of David, from the line of David. They have 12 tribes. So if Israel had 12 tribes, why must David be the one through whom? And David's tribe was Judah. But David gave Judah that boost or that honor because of him. But what is it about David? Is it because he could sing songs? And I, I, I remember I was talking about where the, there's this song we know it's sung in churches, when the spirit of the Lord is upon my life, I will dance like David danced. I remember I was preaching somewhere and I, the message was pray, uh, thanksgiving the David's way. And most of the, most of the people, when I said thanksgiving the David's way, they knew that David is a dancer. Because that's, that's the closest thing we normally use to describe David, that he danced. If it's not that, then he, could, he killed Goliath. So he killed Goliath and danced. That were some of the great things about David, so long as people who are familiar with Bible stories concerned. But when you go back a little bit, you realize that David just didn't dance or he didn't just kill Goliath. He established the Davidic dynasty. He didn't lose a war. Why didn't David lose any battle? He didn't lose any battle because he was given the exclusive privilege of establishing the kingdom of God on earth or establishing the kingdom of Israel, which at that time was kind of the kingdom of God. So he was the only one who could give them peace and establish. So when they spoke about the Messiah coming as the seed of David, what the Jews were expecting was somebody who would come and say, deliver them from the occupation of the Romans or all world powers. And because in the time of David, Israel was not subject to any, any government or any foreign or power. Or, no. Israel had their greatest peace in David. And then David passed it on to Solomon. So Solomon's reign, they, they didn't fight one battle. And they had the peace to build. It's such interesting. David cleared the grounds. What Solomon did was so significant. Because you can't build certain things until there's a certain type of peace. There are some things you can never do in the time of war. Certain things can only be done in times of peace. Yeah, that's right. yeah. There is something called Pax Romana. Pax Romana is the Roman peace, the time the Roman government was in power and they had that peace, Pax Romana, the peace of the Roman Empire. But you cannot do some things if there is no peace. 
David was the one who God used to pave the way to create the, uh, the peace of Israel as a kingdom for them. Now, watch this. God delivered them, he, or he sent Jacob, or you, oh, let me go back again. He called Abraham. From Abraham started forming a people. Got Isaac, and then passed the grace onto Isaac, and then from Isaac, it was passed on to Jacob. And then when it got to Jacob, it, it blossomed and became a nation called Israel. So Jacob is called Israel. And then when they became a nation, they were sent into a foreign land as immigrants. <laughs> so he was, they were sent. Jacob didn't want to go because, watch this, Abraham, Abraham went down to Egypt, or the, towards the borders of Egypt, and pitched a tent there. It wasn't the best. And then in the time of Isaac, there was famine, and Isaac was going to Egypt. God said, don't go, Genesis 26. God said, don't go, stay in the land and I'll bless you. And so Isaac didn't go. God didn't allow Isaac to go. So when he came to Jacob's time, then God didn't go to Egypt, but his son was sent there without him knowing and not with, with, with anybody's choice. He was just sold because his brothers were getting rid of him. The guy ended up in Egypt, but it was the plan of God. And so when years afterwards, after um, about 20 years later, when the, the guy was now reigning, he was a ruling uh, authority, his father got to know he was alive and he sent for his father. Jacob was not quick to go. He, in Genesis chapter, I think 46 or 45, somewhere there, he actually prayed and God said, Jacob, it's okay to go down to Egypt. So Jacob's going to Egypt, it was God, uh, Genesis 47 verse 3, and he said, I am the God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. All right, come on. Not where you are, there. Even though you are living the promised land, I'm sending you into the wilderness, I'm sending you, and they didn't know slavery was coming. And when they arrived in Egypt, they got the best of the land called Goshen. Because Joseph was in charge. He gave them the best of the land. They gave them the best of treatment. And they were flourishing. Things were going well for them. They had jobs. They bought houses. Nice, some of them, five-bedroom house, seven-bedroom house. They were getting good jobs. Some of them were changing their cars. They were doing well, prosperous. They were eating McDonald's. I mean, they were prosperous. Things, and and they, are, they are relatives from Nigeria and Ghana and... <laughs> We're saying that, oh, please send us, and they started even building houses back home, sending money back home. They were doing well, and suddenly, a different government came into power. <laughs> a certain government came into power who did not have ties with Joseph, who brought them. And then he felt like, he did, Bible said he didn't know Joseph. And the people were, Exodus chapter um, 1, the people were beginning to prosper, flourishing, becoming, becoming too powerful. So he started to persecute them. He started to put pressure on them. But that was, God was forming a nation. See, God has different means, to, different ways to, do, to carry out his agenda. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. When you may think, when people, like, like you find on the church of Philadelphia, people thought that church is too small. If you wanted a lively church, you would go to Philadelphia. You would go to the church uh, in, in Pergamos. The church in Pergamos was very lively. But the church in it was booming. It was successful. The church of Philadelphia was little. It was little. It wasn't as exciting. Their, their musicians were not even good with the, the, the music. <laughs> when the choir sing or sang, you will feel you will feel like, wow, what is this? <laughs> and yet they have kept the ah, I feel like preaching. And yet they have kept the word of God. Men were looking down on them, but Jesus said, That's my church, that's my church, that's my church, that's my church. <laughs> and so what men give a tick, a correct tick, is not necessarily what God is approving. <laughs> He, he sent them to Egypt because he was going to fold, uh, form the people in Egypt. But form them, why do you have to form them in slavery? 
Why do you have to go and form them in these harsh conditions? Known to God are all his works from the foundation of the earth. He sent them to Egypt and formed them in Egypt. And when the time came, he brought them out. <laughs> he brought them out and took them. He said, when he, uh, Moses, was, uh, Moses sent, when he sent Moses to go to Egypt to go and bring him, he said, Pharaoh, let my people go that they might worship me. You are compromising on your worship for marriage. But he delivered them so they can worship him. So it looks like his, his, his ultimate agenda was the worship of his people. What is it that you are looking for in life that is beginning to make you compromise on your worship? He said, let them go that they might worship me. And in the forming of the people, he formed a people who will worship him. I will explain it. He, <laughs> in the wilderness, that's before they left. I'm still on church of um, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. <laughs> Just before they left, he said, Moses, tell them to go to their neighbor, neighbors, the Egyptians, and borrow gold and silver and borrow and the Bible said, they went to them and said, can you loan me some gold? The mm. Bible said, uh, 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 how much gold do you want? Mm. Oh, I just, maybe I want maybe a, a thousand mm. pounds worth of gold. Mm. He said, no, I, my, what I've got is about 15,000. I can give you, you just take, yeah. take it. God moved their heart and the people gave them their gold and their jewel and silver. And they, meanwhile, they're about to travel next day. They're about to leave next, the next day, but the people gave them, take it. Anytime you're ready, bring it back. I'm not, you, you may not see me back. Don't worry. I know it will be okay. Gave, them, gave it to them, and they left Egypt. Mm. Then they got to the wilderness, and God said to Moses, Moses, tell the children of Israel to make me a temple, a tabernacle. Mm. Collect the gold. <laughs> really? He said, tell the women they should bring all their jewelry. They should bring it. Bring the gold that they've got. Bring it. Because it says that thou shalt remember the Lord your God. De Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. It said, thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. For it is he who gives you power to make wealth. Why? That he might establish his covenant which you swore to your, uh, unto thy fathers. At his so the reason why he was promising you is because of his own covenant. Watch this. When people read it, they see it as God has promised to bless me. That's why he's blessing me. No. Wow. It is he's blessed blessing you because he wants to fulfill a plan he has. That's why he called you. So he actually, uh, he actually called you to use you. Yeah. God called you to use you and afterwards reward you more than you could ever imagine. He said, give me your gold. And afterwards he said, I'm going to put you on a street of gold. <laughs> so he, he watch this then when they got out of Egypt and they became a nation they became a nation they stayed in the wilderness for a long time and he led them into finally Canaan land divided the land for them and they were battled they have to kill them they have to defeat their enemies one after the other little by little God said he didn't drive them all at once other than that, there will be too much for you. So I'll drive them out, one after the other. So when they were all driven out, the people said, we also want king like our people. But God had David in mind. God raised David. And David came and stabilized, because Saul used to go for war. That's why Goliath came. And David came, he fought the, Phil the, Palest so the, the Philistines. <laughs> David came and fought the Palestinians, oh, sorry, the Philistines. David, <laughs> he fought the Philistines and fought them. He killed Goliath. And many people think David is David because of Goliath. No. The Go Goliath was just a challenge to crown him a champion. So the challenge was necessary for him because without Goliath, David wouldn't have entered that office. People wouldn't have known that this guy, God's hand was on him. So that was just an announcement that God has chosen somebody. And eventually, he became the king. And when he became the king, he fought so many wars, he never lost one battle. And guess what? He established the 
the, the kingdom of Israel. There was so much peace. He established it. As soon as he was established, it was established. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. <laughs> like this, my God, you are too many. I want to under, let you understand why Jesus said, I have the key of David. Not the keys, the key. When he spoke about the kingdom, he said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. It is not the same as the key of David. So, he said, and it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest around, around about from all his enemies, that means he's finished fighting. God has given him rest. There's no battling. When God, when God had given him rest, he began to ask God a question. He said that, prophet, come, look at where I live. I live in such a glorious house. My, my job is good. Some of you, your biggest breakthrough is your job. <laughs> the way you like your job, you've got a good job. For what? That he might establish his covenant. Other than that, it's not, God is not behind it. See, God doesn't just bless people for the sake of blessing. God has always been a God of an agenda. And the agenda is not for people. The agenda is for his own purpose. So, David, when he has settled down, he said, God has given him rest. Look, I live in a nice house. But he said, but the Ark of the Covenant, which epitomizes or signifies the presence of God in his people, it is still living in tent. So that means that I want to build a house for God. Ah. And when he said that, later, you see, David, as soon as he got the established the kingdom, the next thing was the worship of God. A place for God. And so I'm going somewhere. And so he sent to the prophet Nathan. said, Nathan, please come. Look at me. In other words, he was telling Nathan, I want to build a, something for God. A, temp, a tabernacle or a temple, sorry, a temple for God. And Nathan said, King, do what is in your heart. Verse 4 said, that night, the Lord came to Nathan and said, Nathan, David has got the key. <laughs> said, Nathan. The God, the Lord, uh, 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 he said, go and tell myself, and uh, that's here the Lord. Thou shall, uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> shall thou build me a house for me to dwell in? You? And he said, listen, I don't know how that entered your heart. But since I brought the people from Egypt, God made reference. Since I brought them from the wilderness, from somewhere, verse 9, 10. He said, since I brought, see, I brought them, the children are for easy. So he went and formed them in Egypt, now birthed them out of Egypt. So the Bible says that out of Egypt have I called my son. That's why Jesus was, had to be taken to Egypt when he was born and Herod wanted to kill him. He was taken to Egypt. That it might be fulfilled by what the prophet said, that out of Egypt have I called my son. So Israel was a type of Jesus. And God said, when I brought you out of Egypt, I didn't ask, I didn't make qualms about no one has built me a house. I didn't complain about people are not giving offering. I didn't complain about now that they have got a good job, they are not paying their tithes. I didn't complain about it. <laughs> I don't know who God is talking to. <laughs> he said, I didn't, I didn't make issues about that. I didn't make issues about that. And now that when I, oh, come on, watch this. When you appoint somebody in your company, or you create a role for the person, won't you tell the person what you want them to do? So God, when he appointed all the leaders, the judges, and the prophets, the kings, he told them exactly what he wanted them to do for his people. And none of them was instructed to build a house. So then God didn't make that a priority. Why? Even though that was his ultimate priority. Why didn't he ask them to build me a house? He said, do you know why? Because man cannot build for God. Man can't, you, you don't need. You don't have what he said. The almighty God, the creator of heaven, does not dwell in temples made by hands. He said, you can't do it. And so he didn't ask them. But David went ahead of God. That's where the key entered his heart. David went ahead of God when God had not asked for a house. He went ahead of God and said, God, I want to build a house. God said, go and tell David he can't build it because... He's fought a lot of wars. Mm. He gave a natural explanation. Right, okay. And he said, there's one. Hmm. He said, a, a seed of his is going to do that. Right. Verse 12 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. I want to show you something. 
So, and David said, God told David that, and when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up, uh, up thy seed after thee. Mm -hmm. After you are dead and gone, I will set the person up. Solomon was set up when David was alive. Yeah. I will set thy seed after thee, and that and which shall proceed out of thy bowels is to be the son of David. And I will establish his kingdom. Watch the next verse. Watch the next verse. This is your he he the, this guy's kingdom which I'm about to establish. It is this guy. He shall build my uh, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his th uh, the throne of his kingdom for how long? Forever kingdom. Who can this be then? Can have this. No. Yeah. Jesus is the one who is the king forever. That's right. So that is why Jesus could not have not been the seed of David. It was at that time when David it entered David's heart. I want to build a house for you when God had not requested it, even though that was his ultimate. Ult, what's God's ultimate agenda? His house. Oh, you get it. God's ought, the reason why God created human beings mm. is for him to dwell amongst them. Yeah. So when they came out of Egypt, they, he told them, Moses, tell them to build something, a temporal structure for me that I might dwell. Exodus chapter 25, I think verse 8 or so, I believe 7 and 8. That I might dwell amongst them. Go, and let them make me a sanctuary. What? Let's read that from the Spirit. Let's go. You are thinking God is happy in heaven. In heaven is okay. But it's the reason why he created the earth is to put man here so he can dwell in man. So those of you who think that eventually we are all going to be staying in heaven and be singing and dancing. No, 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 it's not going to be like that. We are all going to come back on earth again. He said, I saw the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven from God onto the new earth. Revelation chapter 22. Verse 1. He said, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And then he showed me, no, verse 21, ch chapter 21, I'm sorry. Chapter 21 from verse 1 and 2. He said, and I saw, Revelation 21, said, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed out. That's why you don't have to fix everything on this earth. It's passing. Look at the next verse. I like this. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Prepared what? Prepared as a bride, the church. Prepared as a bride. We are the bride of Christ. Prepared as a bride. Adorned for it. So the revelation, the Bible is going to end with marriage. It started with marriage, ending with marriage. Wow. wow. So, watch this. He called them in the wilderness, tell them, let them make me a tabernacle, tent, that I might dwell amongst them. God, God's, look at the next verse. Re 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 Revelation 20, 21, verse 2. Look at the next verse. Let's all read it together. Let's go. how life ends. Do you know how life is going to end? The bride and the groom are going to live ever happily after. Amen. Read it. And what is the bride and the groom, the relationship? It's a God dwelling with his people forever. That's why he created man. And when he created man, he gave dominion, subdued the earth and replenish it. Because why? He created man to reflect him so that he will be in man. And then sin came and destroyed it. Then David comes. He said, look, even though human is destroyed, I want to build a temple to still reflect you. Ah, God said, you are getting it. So David, what? You see, David, we, they all had issues. So Saul, Moses, everybody. Moses didn't go to the promised land because of character. If there was somebody who shouldn't have been giving credit to David, he, he, he committed adultery with somebody's wife and killed the man who was loyal to him. And then Jesus <laughs> asked the disciples, who do men say I am? Matthew chapter 26, sorry, chapter 16, verse 13. Who do men say I am? Some say you are this, some say you are this. And then he said, who do you say I am? And then Peter, when Peter said from verse 16, that thou art the Christ, the son of the, the, the living God. 
The Christ is supposed to be the son of the living God. The Jews didn't know that. What the Jews knew at that time was that Christ was going to be the son of David. That was a common knowledge. But the living God one, they didn't know. Are you getting what I'm saying? They didn't know about that. They thought it's just, so that's why Peter Jesus said, this one man can't let you know. Then when he said that you are the son, did you know what Jesus said? He said, you are Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then you are someone, upon this rock, this revelation, I'll build my church. I'll do what? But whoever said he's going to build it, he's just telling his manifesto, I am here to build a church. Ah. The builder, the builder. Jesus said, I am here to build. And no one on earth was given the right to build without the key. And the key, the key was given to David. And God, that day David said, I want to build God a house. In 2 Samuel chapter um, 7, verse, we are reading verse 12, verse 13. Let me, show, let me round it up and I'll show you something. He shall build me a house, uh, he shall build a house for, for my name. And I establish, look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. I'll be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I'll, I'll, I'll chasten him with the rod of men and with the, 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 the stripes of men. Now, so he said, he shall be, watch this. Go to the, the verse 13. That's the one I'm looking for. This one I'll explain later. Verse 13. He said, he, he shall build a house for my name and I'll establish his kingdom. Yeah. When the days are, I'll raise a seed. Who seed? Who seed? Baby. Baby seed from your body. Okay. Now look at verse 14. He shall be who? Huh? I'm sorry, I'll be his father. God said, I'm going to raise your seed, but I will be his father. So whose, whose son is he going to be? Son of God. No, but he's the son of David. God said, I'm going to share. That's why, sir, the last question Jesus asked the Pharisees, and no one did ask him a question again in his life when he was on earth, was this question. They were asking question, 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 question. Matthew chapter 22. Every day, get to question. Every. Then verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, 42, what did he ask them? Say, what think he of Christ? Whose son is he? That's a serious question. Jesus said, okay, I'll have a question. They kept asking questions. He said, I'll ask you a question. What do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? A normal Jewish person knows that the Christ is supposed to be the son of David. So let's, let's see the question, they, 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 how they answered. Verse 42. So he said, they said, they said, the son of David. Were they right? Were they right? Yes. So go to the next verse. Then Jesus asked another. Then he said unto them, how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Because a, a, a Jewish father will not call his son my Lord. But he quoted Psalm 2. David said, the, David was speaking and he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand to my major. And uh, David was saying that my Lord. So talking about the Messiah, they all knew he was talking about the Messiah. But they have, it didn't click. So Jesus brought it to light. He said, if he's supposed to be the son of David, how come David is calling him my Lord? Yeah. Go to the next verse. The Lord, the, 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 he quoted the psalm. So I make, go to the next verse, 45. Five. If David called him Lord, how is he his son then? How is Jesus, the, how is the Christ the son of David when David is called, oh yes sir, yes sir. That is a, a complex human mind cannot solve. So Islam will tell you Jesus is not the son of God. It's, too, it's way above the human mind. It only can be encapsulated by the human spirit. And if your human spirit is dead, you can't get this. You'll be just making mental calculations. Oh, all this, all this. You'll be talking and talking. You can't even make sound arguments. But come on, in the spirit, you are off. Because God decided to share a son with somebody because do you know why? Because one day God had planned that he himself is going to come down as the son of God and come and build the tabernacle. He has planned it from eternity. And then suddenly eternity broke into the heart of David. And David said, I want to build God a house. No one has ever said that. God said, David, I've not ever asked, I never asked anybody. And because you have said it, I'm going to make sure now I'm going to make a covenant with you that even when you are dead and gone, nobody is going to build, no human being. I'm going to come as a human being. But this on earth, when it comes to the, the temple and the actual house of God, nobody will be built if the person is not your son. 
That's the key David had. From that time, the key was handed to him that you have the title deed on earth. So then if God has it in heaven, you have it in earth. If I'm coming on earth, I have to partner with you. Come on. Come on. I have to partner with you. That is when David became, so guess what? When the New Testament, the New Testament, the, New, the Old Testament was the old way God was doing. The New Testament is when the new covenant came in, when God himself. And the New Testament opens up with the first name in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. It says that the genealogy, Jesus, the most important person in the New Testament, followed by what name? David. Before Abraham came in. Very interesting. So he said, no, come on. Jesus was not a direct son of David. Why didn't he say Solomon? And then they started, he started mentioning, I'm not going to this again. He started mentioning the genealogy of Jesus. So he says that, go, go, go to the verse, okay. And Judas begat Perez and Perez, and this begat to, this begat to, this begat to. And then he comes to verse 6, and he's, look at verse 6. Look at, and Jesus began, begat to David. He had, no one had the title attached to his name. But even when God, when the Bible mentioned the name of David, he said, David the king. <laughs> and guess what? And David the king begat Solomon the king. No. No. Who? Solomon. 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 And Solomon begat who? Uh, by, uh, by the, uh, and Solomon begat Re They didn't mention, and nobody in the genealogy of Jesus was given the title of a king. Wow. But all these guys were also kings. Yes. Because Jesus came from the lineage, the royal dynasty. He was, there's a royal blood in his, in his blood. He had a royal blood. So his great-grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, grandfather, uh, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, wherever you look at it, whether through Joseph or through Mary, he had, if we, with Joseph, because I told you this, it, with the Jews, it takes its pat, paternal trans, transference. If, you are not, if your father is not a king, you can't be a king. So you can, you are only, you have the right of royal right through your father. So that is why Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus Christ, the representative, had to be a seed of David so that Jesus can have the royal right. But he never had Joseph's blood. He had the bl royal blood through Mary. Ah. Okay. Oh, so if you don't get it. So, all right, I'm going too far from uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Now, so God told David, I'm going to share a son with you. That is the greater blessing of, of all times. And the, the Bible ends, the last name in the Bible is who? Jesus Christ. What about the last but one name in the Bible? David, apart from Jesus. It's David. Revelation chapter 16, sorry, 22 verse 16. After Jesus showing John all this revelation, he's now saying that this thing is sealed. And he said, I have... I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things, uh, these things, uh, these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. What's the meaning of that? Jesus said, Jesus himself now says it. I'm the root and the offspring. Which one is which? You can't be the root and the fruit at the same time. <laughs> He's the only man who chose to be born. He's the only man who can be the fruit and the root at the same time. In the beginning was the word. He has always been. Yeah. So before everything started, he was, that's why you could tell the Jews, Listen, you guys don't understand. Before Abraham, I am. <laughs> so before David, that's why I asked the Pharisees, if David is calling, if he's the son of David, how come David said he's my Lord? Yeah. That means that he is the root of David. He, David, David stems out of him. And yet he stepped out of David. Yeah. 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 It, when, when he was describing, he said, This is Jesus, I am. Mm. I am the root and the offspring of David. David had a special place in the heart of God. Why? Watch this. Why? The, what, key, what key did he get? How, what was the key for that special place? He said, I'll build God a house. That's the key. And now, when he appeared to the church of Philadelphia, he said, I am the one who is holy. I am he who is true. I am he who has the key of David. The key. The key that determines who becomes member of God's house. Ah. <laughs> you can't be a Christian or you can't be a people of God mm. if Christ has not authorized it. Mm. 
He said, every door I shut is shut. Any door I open is open. There are some nations he has opened the door for the gospel. Other nations, the doors are shut. He's aware of it. <laughs> when we hear open door, we are talking, I'm thinking about new job. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. God has opened some doors for me. Doors. I have doors. <laughs> when we think about doors, read your Bible. All the time Paul spoke about doors. Um, um, Acts chapter, chapter 14, verse 27. Look at it. Acts 14, 27. They mentioned door in the book of Acts. He said, and when they, they were come and had gathered the churches together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Anytime Paul used the word door, he was talking about people coming into Christ, coming into the church, becoming part of the household of God. It's not people are getting new jobs. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. How about that? Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to trials to preach the gospel, a, a, a door was opened. The door is talking about in the kingdom, oh, yes. preaching, oh, sister preaching, oh, no marriage preaching. <laughs> A door was open to me. Preaching. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. How about that? How about that? Let's all read it from the screen. Let's all read it from the screen. For a great door and effectual is open unto me. And there are many adversaries. He's talking about the preaching of the gospel. Somebody shout doors. Shout doors. So when Jesus said, I open and nobody shuts, no one shuts. And when I shut, no one can open. He's actually talking about the door into the kingdom. Now I'm going to show you something. You like, it. let's go back to Philadelphia. And the, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? These things say, he who is holy, he who is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, he that shuts and no man opens. We will come back to the door. It's going to show up again. But let's go to the next verse. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. He, I, I was studying and I realized that every of the church he starts with, I know your works. I just, I, I just, I just let me look at what you do matters to God. Oh. What you do and what you are doing, sister, what you are doing is really watching you, <laughs> brother. He's watching you. He said, "I know your thy works, not your heart." <laughs> Those people who say that, oh, God knows my heart. Don't mind. Tell them he said he knows your works. <laughs> Let's worry. When he's talking to the church, he said, I know your heart. He never did he tell the church, I know your heart. He said, I know your works. All the seven churches, none of them. He, and he didn't ignore any work they do. Or they did, whether good or bad. He said, I know your works. I, I'm, 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 at this juncture, I'm just wondering what is being recorded in your name as your works. Lord have mercy. On the judgment day, he says the books, the books were opened. Revelation chapter 22. Wow. Books were open from verse 12, 13, 14. Wow. Books were wow. open. Books. Books. Books were opened. Yeah. For what? To keep the, to check the records. Yeah. Revelation, sorry, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <laughs> verse 10. It says that for we must all appear before the judgment seat of God, that everyone will give account of what he has done in the body. What he has done, not what he has thought, not what he has imagined, what he has done. Not what he has wished. You better do what you are wishing because you will not, you'll not be reward, rewarded for your wishes. You'll be rewarded for your works. Yes. Hmm. So he said, I know your works. Let's go back to Philadelphia. I, verse 8. I know your works. Behold, I have set before thee. Ah. An open door. This is the door we are talking about. Not an open door for financial prosperity. Mm. God prospers those who are working for him. Yeah. Yeah. He said, I open, or I've opened before you. I know your works. And I've opened before you. I have set before 
thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. That also means that you are very little. God, Jesus knew that that church was the smallest amongst all the other churches. A small church. When you go there, they are not vibrant. When I say vibrant, exciting. Emotionally hyped. Uh, the church of Pergamos was like that. When you go, you, you, are, you have world-class singers and musicians playing. You, you, oh my God, I love this too. They, were, they looked alive. They were lively but not loyal to Christ. The church was full but not faithful to Christ. They looked successful. Very successful. Everyone, you, wow, this church, wow, wow. Successful, but they didn't have the life of God. That's the church of Pergamos and Sardis. They were alive. But this one was little. The little, the tiniest among, little strength. They didn't have great financial power to be hiring big venues, buying their own. Or to, they had little strength. He said, I know your works. I've opened a door. Uh, I've set a door, an open door, uh, before the an open door, and no man can shut it. And for thou hast little strength, uh, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. This thing. You have little strength, you have kept my word. Keeping God's word is not like I believe it. I obey it. That's what it means to keep the word of God. They have kept my word. He said, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Say the name. The name. He haven't denied my name. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 33, this is a quite scary one. Matthew 10, 33, Luke 12, 9. See what it says. Let's all read it aloud. Let's go. Jesus said this. <laughs> Wow. Jesus will deny some people. That's a serious one. That's a serious one. Can you imagine your day of need? You need some supernatural intervention. And you are calling, and you say, Angels, I don't know this one. I deny you. Luke chapter 12, verse 9. Thank you, Jesus. Luke chapter 12, verse 9. He that denied, let's read it, let's go. But he that denied. Angels who are supposed to be assigned to help you. He says, they, you, they, you'll be denied before the angels. They said, shall we act? He said, no, we, this one is not known. It's not recognized. He <laughs> says, you have not denied my name. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. You haven't denied my name. If we suffer, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Many people don't know this is in the Bible. I don't know. He said, the Bible says he also denied those who deny him. That's a serious one. And then people will later on say, God, you have let me down. If you don't take care, you go off God's way. You may miss your chance. Sir, he said, I've been young and now I'm old. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken or sin. If you do it God's way, you will never be a victim. Amen. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8, 28. If you do it God's way, you will not be a victim. Yeah. But those of us who think that we are smart, we, will, we want to eat our cake and have it. We want to combine two. You know, God, God will understand. Am I preaching at all? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, Philadelphia. So, back on the screen, please. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know your works. And you have denied my name. Okay, so, said you are, sorry, you have not denied my name. You have, not, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Let's look at So, watch this. Go to verse 8. Let me show you something. God promised, Jesus promised them what he's going to do. He said, I... I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. Do you know what the open door was? I told you, for the gospel. Yeah. So the church will be more effective. I said something last week, but a few of us didn't pick up on it. I'll repeat it. A faithful church is a blessing to the community in which, in which it is. 
Can I say that again? God cannot save without a, a faithful church. Any church that is faithful is a blessing to the communities in. It, it becomes the hub for God to visit yes, the communities. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. There are communities in our times that have dead churches. God can't save without faithful churches. Church of Philadelphia was a faithful church. And so God said, I've watched it. I've set before you an open door. That is, an open door means they are about to experience increase. Because people are more, more people are going to be born again. Increase. Look at verse 9. He gave them increase. And he said, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come, come and worship before, uh, before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. He said the Jews, you know, those days, the Jews were a problem to the early church, the synagogues. That's why they were killing them earlier. But I said, these Jews who have looked down on you, I'm going to prove them wrong. They will come and bow in fact, there's a scripture I was going to quote in Isaiah. He said, I'll make your, the, the children of your enemies come and bow before you. I think I need to find that scripture. The Jews will come. He said, they will come and bow before you. In, in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says some people call themselves Jews, but they are not Jews indeed. Romans chapter um, eight, 8, verse, no, 2, verse 28, I'm sorry. Romans 2, 28. Can we all read it aloud together? Let's go. Verse 29. Verse 29. Inwardly. So, amen. So it's, 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 it's an inward issue. Being a Jew, Jesus said that some people will say they are Jews, but they are not really the true Jews. And those are the people who were persecuting the church. They were really bothering the church. And Jesus said that these people who think they are more powerful than you, who think they are better than you, who think they are doing better than you, or you are nobodies and you are, he said, I'll make them come and bow before you and worship and for I'll make them know I have loved you. Some of you, some people have wrote, written you off. That's okay. It's all right. But so now I'll give you three, three things he said I, I was promising you. One, I'll give you what? Increase. Verse 8. Verse 9, I'll give you influence. The Jews who have left you, they are coming to Bab. I'll give you influence. And then number three, look at verse 10. And I'll go back and finish this. Number, number three says that, because thou hast kept my word, uh, the, sorry, the word of my patience, I will also oh, keep for him to keep you. He said, because you have kept my word, I will also keep you from, watch this, keep you from the hour of temptation which will, shall come upon all, all the world and try them that dwell in there. Temptation, tri not temptation, it's tribulation. Mm. Tribulation is why he said, I'll keep you. That's immunity. Yeah. Mm. He gave them increase, influence, and immunity because of their faithfulness. God has a way of keeping you immune from what others will suffer from when you are faithful. God has a way of giving you increase where others are decreasing. God has a way of giving you influence when others are being discredited. Be faithful. Philadelphia, a church that is faithful. A faithful church. Somebody say a faithful church. Let me end by adding. I wanted to end showing the three names he said you give them. That's why I want Philadelphia has changed names three times. He said, I'll give you name. They will understand it better. But I think because of time, let me just end on this. Verse 10 again. Verse 10. Verse 10 said, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Let's all say the word of my patience. The word of my patience. Can you give us the New Living Translations? Let's see. Translation, how does it say? Let's read it out together. So, the, my command to persevere. NIV. NIV. All right, let's go. That's the one I want. Let's read it. To endure. 
Patient. To endure. Patient. Louder to endure. Patient. This is a generation that does not have patience. We have been given to, that's the big words, two, two big words are coming. Now I'll top it up with one final long one I said earlier on. I told you I will. We have given ourselves or much of the gospel in this generation is an existential gospel. Instead of preaching an eschatological gospel, we are preaching an existential gospel. Existential gospel or relating to God only existentially has to do with the current situation, current benefits, current climate, current peace. So all your life is just what you are getting now, how things are happening for you now. But the Christian life is actually eschatological in its main approach. Eschatological has to do with the, how things are going to be in the future, the coming, the end times. How your life is going to end is more important than what you are getting now. Yes. That's true, that's true. So people are in church just for existential reasons. It can be okay, but our eschatological reasons for being in church must overshadow and supersede us. That is why you get offended and leave a church God is going to bless you in. Mm. Wow. This is just existential. Mm. Ah, I didn't like the music, but the word is building you up. We have become a generation that has been stripped of patience. Everything must be instant. Everything must be immediate. And that is what is making the, Lord, the church lose its, its strength. Because the strength of the church, look, watch this, you like this. The church, watch this, we live with our focus on the future. We live with the future breaking into the present. So the excitement we have in the present is because of the future. Yes. Wow. We are not excited because things are happening now that will make us hopefully it will continue. No, we are so hopeful, so sure, so certain about the future, it breaks into our present. Yeah. Everything that I'm gonna come up to drop the big another big word. Theological word, but it's good, it's good. All right. Everything you are doing in life, when they tell you that. When secularists tell you that uh, all life is about today, eat and drink, don't worry about time and fu- future. No, this is, the, this is the only time you have. <laughs> this is the only moment you have. Live your life as though life is all about today. Christianity is not like that. It's not like that. Everything we do as Christians must uh, there's this word that su- subspecies itinatetus. It's a very important word. <laughs> subspecies itinatetus. Subspecies itinatetus. In other words, you do things in the light of eternity. Okay. It's Latin. <laughs> now my wife says, is it English? <laughs> At least. It's, it's good we know a little bit, uh, we hear some of this theology, because I don't want you to meet some people and later on realize they are so ignorant about some basic theological stuff. <laughs> At least you hear it somewhere, you've heard it in church already. Yes. Subspecies itinatetus. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, can you spell it for us? The way you hear it, write it. <laughs> <laughs> So, doing things and living life in the light of eternity. Because, listen, life is not just today. And life is not just on earth here. When you die, then you are going to meet the real deal. So, every human being, and particularly, is, mom, is it not sad that there are Christians who live with blatant blindness towards eternity? And it's very common in our modern day churches because of this prosperity, existential gospel. It's all now. When do you want your miracle? Now. Now. (laughs) 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 That, 
<laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Stand and collect. <laughs> you know that instant photo or the pin hole camera. Stand and collect. Don't go. We don't have to watch. Just stay there. We we'll take it and then give it to you. <laughs> it's, it's very important. <laughs> it, that's what we want. Watch this. That in itself is not bad. But if that becomes the whole focus of Christianity, then that is what opens the door for sin to slip in easily. It opens the door for patience to slide out. And you can't walk with God without patience. I know you are going through difficult times, but you got to know how to be patient and keep the word. Keep God's word. Hold on to it. Don't compromise on your stand. Don't compromise. Never give up. It doesn't matter what comes. Never give up. Never change your approach. Never. Never give up. That is a Christian. A Christian come a hell or high water. They still maintain their confession. They t- look at Joseph. Look at all that happened to him. Potiphar's wife offered him the best opportunity in the house. He said, I will never do it. He ran away and left his coast, ended up in prison, but still kept his faithfulness towards God. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, for I've run a good race and I've kept the faith. Whatever happens, he said, I've fought a good fight, I've finished my court, and I've kept the faith. Yes. Whatever happens, keep the faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Keep the faith if it means losing your job. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Keep the faith if it means losing a marriage. Mm. Mm. Wow. A potential marriage. Or whatever. A marriage. A potential marriage. <laughs> 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 Keep the faith. The key of David. The key of David is the authority to engage in church building. The key of David is the authority to engage in soul winning. The key of David is the authority to be a partaker of God's eternal economy. And Jesus is the one who can give it to you. The key of David. I pray that God will help us all. Did you receive something today? Wow. We thank God for using his servant, Reverend Dr. David Entry, to share this awesome word. If this message has blessed you in any way, please spread the word by sharing it and send us an email to amen at charis.org. Remember to stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter for regular updates on what God is doing here at Charis Ministries. Stay blessed.